Oh yeah, I just love grooving out to that music every single time. And welcome to the CXM Experience. I am, as usual, Grad Khan, CXO at Sprinkler, and here to tell to talk to you about CXM and to talk to you about experience. And we're gonna have kind of a fun episode today. I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the modern customer and uh, the, all the changes that have occurred. So this will be a little bit of a history lesson, but in a fun way, and it'll land on something that'll help you sell the modern customer priority within your own organization. Now, I'm just going to spend a moment talking about CXM. We've uh, had some really, really interesting shows lately, but I haven't had a chance to soapbox on CXM in a while. So I'm going to just jump on that for a second and uh, uh, shout in the county square here. So, so the CXM, Customer Experience Management, uh, it has been a not particularly well-defined category over the years. Uh, it's getting clearer, but I think there are a lot of companies, maybe think is even not even the right word, I would say that I have observed that a lot of companies are claiming to be CXM when they're really CFM, or customer feedback management, which is the way that Forrester would classify them. And what these companies do is they do surveys and they do sort of customer feedback you know, scenarios, um, but that's it. And it gives you a readout of how customers are feeling, but you can't really do anything about it, you know, directly. Uh, CXM, in the opinion of Sprinkler and a growing number of people, uh, has an emphasis on the M, which is management. So I want to understand the customer experience by listening to what the customer is saying, but I also need to act on it. I need to love my customers. And if someone's in pain or if someone's happy or whatever the, the emotional state is, I need to act on it and get back to it. I need to be able to take care of the customer in whatever way is appropriate at the moment that that's occurring. Uh, that's a big challenge for most organizations. And there are some incredible efforts going on around the world and a lot of different companies to make that happen. But it's, it's, a, it's a big, exciting challenge. And uh, that's sort of the future of CXM. I'm really excited to be part of that. So uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the modern customer. Uh, we, we've I kind of assume the modern customer a bit, and I'm going to actually walk through a little bit of a story on how things have evolved. You hear me talk about 20th century versus 21st century. You hear me talk about broadcast versus conversation. You probably heard me say static web and conversation web. And so there's a bunch of these terms that I just want to frame it all within a single flow and just sort of put it down. And I think, yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. It should be kind of fun. Um, so we're going to start, you know, in the beginning. Um, and in the beginning, there was the birth of broadcast. This is really where everything changed. Uh, and it is really not that long ago. You know, it's a few generations. But in terms of human history, you know, most of our human history has been about talking to each other. And so humans have evolved and our systems have evolved and our communication has evolved in a face-to-face -face way, which is why what was so weird about the late 19th and 20th century is that we actually moved into a very different way of communicating with each other. And uh, some may look back at it as being somewhat short-lived because uh, as we move into the new media of the 21st century, we're actually returning to the way we used to communicate which is more face-to-face, -face, more interactive, more what people call social. Uh, it's a little bit like it doesn't happen very often that something entirely disappears, um, but silent movies did. It was an entirely unique form of communication. Some of the histrionics that you see in a silent movie and some of the kind of over-the-top acting was actually a very subtle code way of the actors to communicate to the audience because they didn't have sound. Um, I guess eight tracks went away. Not many eight track players out there. Cassettes are still hanging in there, but they're probably close to on their way out. But, you know, not many things disappear, but there's a possibility that one day, several hundred years from now, we'll look back on the age of broadcast as a blip in time and something that led to where we are today. So let's talk about the birth of broadcast. So the New York Sun, which is the first penny press, launched in 1833. Uh, illustrated magazines first came out in the 1840s in London. Uh, first films were late 1890s. Uh, radio, there was a Christmas concert broadcast in 1906. And then TV, uh, which was, had its first debut in Schenectady, New York, 
was in 1928. So TV is really like many, there are many people alive today um, who were alive before TV was born, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. So the broadcast model that all this stuff that came out primarily in the 20th century is really about a sender, medium, and receivers. And there's a message. And you can always tell when someone's in a broadcast mindset because they talk about audience. They talk about people listening to what they're saying. What's very reassuring about broadcast is you have complete control of the message and you can define it any way that you want to define it. So it's very reassuring that way. Uh, it gives you sort of a high level of mastery. Uh, in the early days, broadcast was ridiculously effective because it had not appeared before. So it was, you know, things like a lot of the early propaganda, a lot of the propaganda campaigns in the 1930s, were, which looked kind of ridiculous to, in front of today's lens. Um, back then were exceedingly pro effective because they were so new and people weren't used to it. And then there was the birth of the internet, which actually was quite a long time ago, like 51 years ago. So ARPANET was uh, invented in 1969 um, by the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, by 1983, they'd invented the TCP IP protocols, and that was really where it started to become a true packet-driven network. Uh, and things like GopherNet began to evolve with um, browsers like Archie and Jughead and Veronica um, and other things like email began to sort of evolve on top of that. But that's, you know, still the early 80s. And it really wasn't until 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web and the first browser was released in 91 that things really started to get interesting. Uh, NCSA Mosaic Browser, which was my first browser, was released to the public in 1993, and then Netscape was founded in 94, and then everything changed overnight. If you want a really great sort of sort of walk back in time, uh, watch the series Halt and Catch Fire. It's on Netflix now. It was an AMC series, but it's probably the best thing I've ever seen on the evolution of the PC and early dot-com years and uh, exceptional cast and exceptional uh, show. And so, you know, you've got, uh, you've got this sort of time period where, you know, suddenly there's this whole new technology out there, but humans typically will tend to define new technologies by the last one. So if you think about, say, the car, the first cars were not called cars. They weren't even called automobiles. They were called horseless carriages. Um, the first computers were called electronic typewriters. Like, we'll always tend to sort of take the thing we know and then add some sort of qualifier or modifier to it. And you'll, you'll see this all the time. Um, there's another favorite thing people like to do is so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so on crack or so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so on steroids. Like that kind of idea of just constantly trying to redefine it. Or movies, you know, it's... Um, Terminator meets uh, love story or whatever, whatever right? So, so it's like that, that's the kind of thing that people have to do to contextualize stuff. And so a lot of the early websites and a lot of the early work in the web very much reflected the broadcast model. In fact, this is easy to forget, but the first ads online, first web ads, there were a lot of them, uh, weren't clickable. Like they were just like a magazine ad. You know, people thought of it as, oh, there's magazines on a computer or it's the you know, newspapers on a computer or it's the information superhighway. So they're like billboards on the superhighway. So we sort of took that sort of mindset of a flat static image you could do anything with and we just put that in there. Uh, then people said, well, geez, I guess, you know, you could click on these, <laughs> you could do something with it. And then you know, off we go with uh, internet advertising. But a lot of great companies were founded in that period of innovation. And a lot of people don't realize Amazon's pretty old. Uh, it was founded in July, 1994. You know, right around the time that everything was just exploding. Uh, eBay is in 95, Netflix was in 97, Google came out in 98, and Salesforce came out in 99. Some of the, the great companies all sort of came out of that. But they were, they were living in this era of the static web. Nonetheless, some amazing things happen in the static web. And now we start our story of what's happened to the modern customer. Because there are a lot of companies that are like, what has happened? Like, why are people so different? And if you think about it, all these static sites have created these really different expectations. Like Uber, I want to know where my car is at any point in time. I was actually talking with my fiance the other night. We were talking about a delivery and she was really frustrated. The delivery hadn't arrived yet. We didn't know where it was. And she said, I wish I could see where the truck was because I'm used to seeing that with Uber. I'm now used to seeing that with Domino's. Like, why can't I see that with FedEx? Why not FedEx, right? Uh, Google, all the information in the world available instantly for free. Like that's 
created a very high bar. eBay, you know, the world's largest garage sale. I can find any childhood toy I want anytime I want to. Netflix, unlimited entertainment. I'll never be able to stop watching. And so these new expectations are not category based. When people have a new expectation, it's something that transfers across multiple categories. It's something that people start to begin to think is um, the way everything should be, not just things in the um, ride sharing business. It's, 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 but all things should have service transparency. But to a large extent, a lot of these sites and a lot of the activity around getting people to them is still based on this sort of broadcast model. You know, there's still people being driven through a message to click on the medium. Now it's the computer, but still very much a static model. And then things started to change from a technical innovation standpoint. There were two big things that happened right at the turn of the 21st century and did not take long for people to capitalize on them. The first thing that happened was uh, the mobile phone form factor started to get very exciting. Um, the really sophisticated best version of the razor came out in 2000. BlackBerry was really humming by 2000 and they had a very sophisticated um, smartphone in the early 2000s and then the iPhone was invented in 2007. So suddenly we had in our pockets all the functionality that we would normally have had uh, on a desktop. And at the same time at home, we were moving to a model where we were going to broadband. And you know, broadband often is positioned as faster, faster is good, but it's not the faster that's really the innovation. The innovation is always on. And it's easy to forget what it was like to dial up and dial down. There's great studies showing how people would usually go on their computers during commercial breaks when they had um, mo uh, modems and when they had broadband because they could just zip on. It was always on. Um, whereas when people had dial up, they would take a break and spend a half an hour, dial up, do their work, then dial down, come back in. And it's a very interesting behavior change. And people got programmed to being always on. So this concept of always on and always connected started to really evolve. And so very soon, uh, companies started to capitalize on that. And one of the very first ones, and you may have forgotten this company, when I was an early user of it, March 22nd, 2002, Friendster launched. Oh, they were so close. Friendster launched. Man, that must hurt. That must still hurt. Um, but they couldn't keep the service up. That was a real, that was a huge issue with it. In 2002, also LinkedIn launched. Um, people forget how old LinkedIn is. Um, MySpace came out in 2003 and in 2004, Facebook was created um, and took a while to completely roll out. But Facebook, obviously, was a game changer. Twitter is in 2006, Instagram 2010. And so on, you know, Snapchat 2011, so on and so on. So we, suddenly you have all these new modern, what we'll call conversation channels. And what was different about these conversation channels versus the earlier broadcast channels is that they use a stimulus response model. So the, the sender is sending out a stimulus and the receiver is responding, but the, the medium is really start transmitting a conversation. And advertising on these channels that was simply broadcast-based, so just sending out a message, tended to not be very effective. What's more effective is to be able to begin a conversation, have a conversation. That's where stuff starts to get very interesting. And it starts to become, what I love about it, is it starts to become a lot more human. When, an analogy I've used and I, I've talked about before is the comedian. You know, comedians are masters at this. All comedians have the same communication objective. If you saw a comedian with a creative brief, the creative brief would read to convince the audience that I am funny. That's their job. If a comedian was a marketer, um, the classic marketing broadcast mindset would go to the stage, stand at the front of the stage and say, you know, I am funny. 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 Like people would leave the performance and someone would say, Hey, you know, what was the performance like? And the audience member would say, well, you know, he said he was funny. Like they get the message. But would they believe the message? And this is the difference. A lot of companies, one of the reasons that trust is declining for companies is they're not using true stimulus response creative or communication. And so while they're pounding their message out there, people don't believe it. What does a comedian actually do? A professional comedian goes on stage and tells a joke. You hear the joke and hopefully you laugh. While you're laughing, you think to yourself, wow, she's really funny. Like you come to that conclusion on your own. You make the conclusion that she's really funny. No one had to tell you that. And afterwards, someone will say, hey, how was it? Like, oh, she was hilarious. Couldn't stop laughing. 
What were the jokes? What did she say? What did she talk about? You can never remember. You can never remember. All you remember is the conclusion that you drew. Well, I don't know. What did she talk about? I was like a mother-in-law thing. There was an octopus, but I, I can't really like put it together. But I do know what I walked away with, which is she was hilarious. I laughed a lot and you should go see it. So that's what more companies need to do and think. It's a little bit tricky because it does, it does involve risk. And you'll see the companies that really do grab a hold of this getting outsized rewards because many of their peers won't be able to follow them. So what happened, though, is all of these new conversation web properties created a whole bunch of other new expectations, which is public connection, personal connections, uh, the idea that I can read a review on anything I want to buy. I can have you know, professional connections with people from all around the world. I can text and chat with people and socially message them and you know, have discussions. Like That's a very different world we suddenly find ourselves in, in a very connected world. So you've got a customer who's had a bunch of you know, static web expectations of service and freeness and amazingness, and a bunch of conversation web expectations around connection and, you know, being socially part of a fabric of society. And that is what has led to the modern customer. The modern customer has a set of modern expectations. The static web has helped create expectations like my online experience should equal my in-store experience. I expect attention from brands when I want it. Find me and resolve my issues. And the conversation web has created experiences like I always read reviews before I buy a product. I trust people more than companies, and I want a personal experience that knows who I am. And, you know, if you think about some of the data behind this, you know, 63% of shopping journeys now start online, and 75% of customers actually expect a reply within five minutes to anything that they tweet out. This is the static web has driven the set of expectations of instant service. And from a conversation web standpoint, 90% of people now read a review before they pie, and 95% of people tell another person about a bad experience. And most people, 71%, expect personalized ads. And so this is why that customer feels different. And it's a very tricky world. The other thing that's also happened is that the channels in which people interact, because of the conversation web, have changed as well. So you see older generations being comfortable on the phone. But if you look at Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report, What's there's been a mass movement to the social web, to conversation web, to things like messaging apps and mobile applications. So you see a minority preference now for the phone. Um, Many customer service facilities are still phone based and that uh, doesn't make any sense to me uh, at all. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, sort of how we talk about the modern customer. And, you know, the one thing that's uh, kind of interesting is to really understand this person, you've got to pull in all the data from the 24 different social platforms, all the blogs and forums and review sites that are out there, all the apps that might be running in the company, all 11 messaging platforms, web chat, there's billions of conversations that need to be pulled in and understood. Um, But the great thing is that we now have identity and interests for those customers and, you know, half the planet's connected. In fact, it's more than half now. There are 4.6 billion people online, of which 4.1 billion are on social. So we've got the next billion to go. There's a very cool project that Google's running on the next billion, Um, but very exciting times because we've got billions of people and multiple billions of conversations all going at the same time. So how do you reach and persuade this connected customer? And that's what we're going to talk about next time. Um, But for today, I think that's sort of a good review of the modern customer, a little brief history of how we got here. And when you think about why things may be different than they felt, you know, a short while ago, it's because you've got people with very different expectations framed by a bunch of new technologies that have all evolved in the 21st century or very late 20th century. So hope you enjoyed that quick tour. For the CXM Experience, I'm Grad Khan, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>